Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Klaus. Did I mention that I love music on conferences? <laughs> so, who's next? Next one is Christopher Lubeck from Network Team. And he's going to tell about an end-to-end uh, -end CI solution. And uh, he is the CEO and founder of Network Team. So welcome on stage, Christopher. Yeah, so hello everybody. I hope you are fresh from yesterday's party. So yeah, we, ha we have quite some ground to cover, so I'm sorry <laughs> beforehand. Uh, it's, it's quite some stuff, but, but I hope it's interesting for you. And I, I think many of you have seen some parts of it, and um, I'm super happy about discussing other solutions and ideas. So yeah, uh, automation. I really love it if you work on something like a, a CI pipeline scripting and you do something and things automatically work and help you a lot of time, especially if you have processes where things are repeating and you're doing things over and over. And yeah, most of you know automation, why doesn't it work? So. Um, so waiting on a pipeline, you have to retry, you can't deploy because something isn't working. So, yeah, in the end, it's always the little things. Yeah, you know, ah, this small part. So, um, it shouldn't prevent us from automating things, but we, we have to, like, embrace the complexity that some things are not easy and we have to take care about robustness and making things work. So, before, why do we automate and what, what are reasons? Why, why do we do it and uh, put energy and time into it? Um, because in the end, it's, it's, it's some kind of waste. You, it doesn't make the direct product better. It's, it's a process improvement because we learned, ah, we needed to have more complex processes, more tooling and everything um, to, to uh, enable it. Um, so. I, I thought about this, and uh, one thing for me was, yeah, we, we care about the developer experience. That's, but that's one part. If, if, if I have good uh, automation in a project, it can make the difference between it's, it's fun to use and it can really scale to more developers, and then, again, it's not only developers, it's, it's about the creators of projects. It's not, uh, not only people writing code, it's people dealing with content, with... Um, De reviewing design changes in a style guide and you know, having a new node type implementation, checking that it works also from the editing perspective before it hits production and you get feedback from uh, editors and also involving the customer. So, like I said, it's, it's about having fast feedback. Um, if, you, if you want to work agile, one of the, I'm, I'm no agile expert, but I think one of the philosophies is fast fe feedback loops. It's, it's, it's really important also for, for uh, your development process. So this again, I think automation can help there. And um, another important aspect is we don't want people to know how a development uh, deployment works uh, or only single people. And if somebody is not available, nobody knows how to, how to deal with the deployment or changes. So it's super important to capture knowledge 
um, in, in like a stable way and not only a documentation or wiki is nice, but it, it's mostly out of date. So I, I think you heard the term infrastructure as code and GitOps and whatnot. It's, it's, the essence is if you capture the knowledge in something that's really executed, it doesn't get out of date because it's used daily or weekly and um, yeah, until it doesn't work. But <laughs> so. Um, of course, continuous integration. It's, it's a word we mostly use in a different sense than it was uh, originally um, yeah, ideated or, or thought about. So for me, it is, OK, we check that changes don't break anything, that we can work in uh, parallel on projects and check in changes and make sure everything f still fits together. So um, that might be running a build, of course. Um, executing some scripts and making sure um, for JavaScript projects, you mostly have a build phase uh, doing that. Um, so compile code, build front-end assets. Um, and of course, we on not only have the build itself, but uh, for, for most source code nowadays, you have static checks, like uh, having a linter or um, with TypeScript, a type checker, or also in PHP with a Psalm, PHP Stan, or other tools. So um, yeah, that, that's one important part. You want to automate not only on your developer machine, but make sure everybody is um, adhering to the same rules. And of course, testing. Um, how many of you use tests daily in your projects? Yeah. Could be more. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I do testing um, for quite some time, and I, I know there are many, many different approaches from pure TDD to having only end to end tests. Uh, so there, I think, boils down to me possibly a combination of multiple things depending on your project and risk might be the, 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 a good choice. So. Just, just do it, uh, get comfortable with it, and um, yeah, so unit tests, of course, if I have a complex algorithm or some more interesting stuff, it's really good to have that in unit tests inside your packages. Um, also functional tests, doing some things with the database, making sure your queries work, can help you reduce risk, and um, I, I linked it there, so you can, you can look it up in the, in the slides later. Um, there's also a an interesting package, for example, um, to have snapshot tests of fusion presentational objects. So it doesn't take so much time. So we don't use it extensively, but I think it's super interesting to have a good testing strategy. Um, and um, yeah, after testing, you want to release it. So um, I think many of you already do. Autom do you do automated deployments? <laughs> Yeah, OK. Um, so I, I think that's super important to, to have some kind of automation. Mustn't be a, well, it doesn't have to be a complete CI solution, but at least capturing all the steps that are necessary. It really helps you to make them yeah, reproducible. And um, in the end, you want to do it often. You want fast feedback loops. You don't want to work on your project, and after a few weeks, have the next deployment, and things don't work, and somebody forgets steps. And so the more often you do it, uh, the better. So um, yeah, and before we can deploy, we need uh, some artifacts. So artifacts is a fancy word for files and packages, or an archive, or a Docker image that you can use for your production release. So. So we, in the beginning, we, I, I, I started with a project called Surf, uh, which is, I don't know who you, you still uses it, but uh, we, we looked into other communities and they um, yeah, used an approach where you, you fetch from the target server, you fetch git changes and then do stuff. And yeah, I, I think nowadays the, the way is really to think in artifacts, immutable deployments, you build the artifact you make sure it gets to the target node or server or cluster or whatever, runs your code, and um, that, that makes the whole thing really more streamlined. And in the end, what we want to achieve with all that effort is get early feedback from, 
fellow developers, collaborators from the customer. And so we need some place for them to go. In the end, every NEOS project is a website, has a URL. So uh, what we do, and I think that's one of the most important things I, I wanted to achieve when we went into the whole container and Kubernetes uh, yeah, uh, journey. Uh, for us, it, it was a few years ago. Um, it really was to, we want to get this thing for review deployments. It's what we call it. You could also call it preview deployments. It's, it's like having a branch. For each branch, you have a separate deployment. And getting that working with a consistent isolated state, because it, it really helps, I think, you don't always need it, but it makes it so much easier to, to collaborate on projects while developing. Yeah, that's one really important part, and I, I will go into detail there. Um, then, of course, verify correctness. Unit tests and functional tests can only take you so far. Um, in the end, it, it's always good to have a manual test to make sure um, the new feature you, you worked on is really behaving like it should in an iso isolated environment and not only on, on a developer machine. Um, so it, it should happen on some disposable instance. So you get a fresh state, you can do some stuff, maybe you find some issue and you can reset the, the state. And um, I, I've seen countless bugs where it was hard to, to reproduce because you had some other state and interfering and not, not a complete fresh setup, for example. So, and of course, we can automate that. And um, ideally, you have some kind of really important things like user sign up, sending a form, or having some really key result of your project. And that should be captured in end to end tests if possible. So, we can use the same approach run the end to end tests on the environments we carefully prepared for, for feedback. And so, this whole thing fits together really well, I think, if, if you apply some ideas. And we, we can go further. We can also do measurements. We can, um, for some projects, we, um, we already uh, implemented that. And it, it's really interesting if you measure web vitals with the Lighthouse CI, for example, and uh, record metrics, because um, you can do that, of course, with a production instance, but uh, doing that before you go into production also helps, um, for example, really with web vitals, if, if uh, yeah, I don't know, some rules change, you, some things are uh, uh, treated differently after a while, and you want to check that you're still having a, a decent score there, or it doesn't degrade because you implemented a new feature with JavaScript and nobody tested it before, and now you're Initial page load gets bad because, I don't know, there are so many reasons why it could happen. And yeah, that's, that's why we should automate, I think. And that's, we, we get a lot of benefit. It, it helps, of course, if you have a project where, where um, you can allow to do it. And in the end, you can easily copy the approach to other projects. So in the end, it's all files and configuration. And um, if, you want, uh, if you enable this uh, approach for you, you can transfer it to other projects you do. So we can even start to do it for smaller projects, because in the end, it's some boilerplate setup. We can copy or have prepared packages or includes we can apply to a project. So yeah, I, I want to show you how we do it. It's not the only way to do it, of course. We, we have some opinions on what we on, on the tools we use, on the environments we use, but, but it also changes. It's, it's not um, mysled in stone. I don't know the English, <laughs> carved in stone. Um, it's, it's things we change, we learn, we adapt to, to new ideas. And um, this is where this community is awesome because you can, all, all the time you learn new ideas about new tools, new approaches, and this really helps. So, one super important thing I really try to use is having mono repositories. Um, so for all of you that don't know what that means, it means you have one repository that could have many components. We just use the word components for that. It's not front end components or something. It's like, yeah, this is my mono repository. 
and I have my NEOs. I have a documentation that I render, maybe in different formats. I have a native app with whatever technology. I have maybe a JS app front end from my side and some additional microservices. And this all goes into one repository, which has um, a few key advantages. Um, is you don't have to have dependencies for changes to other repositories, manage different versions, if, and, and you, you really save a lot of different commits and pushes and updating versions and fetching packages if you use other approaches of sharing code. And we tried so many approaches like Git submodules and everything, and yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of that, and I think with the tooling nowadays, it it's work, works reasonably fine. Um, and gives you a lot of uh, important uh, features. So yeah, we use GitLab CI. Um, you can use GitHub Actions, you can use Bamboo, there are countless newer ones for GitOps-driven things. Um, all CI solutions have different scopes and different features. I think the ideas are the same at Jenkins, of course, we, we started with Jenkins. Um, yeah, choose what you know, and I think the ideas can be adapted to many different solutions. It's not GitLab special, but I, I will uh, present the approaches uh, with uh, GitLab CI. So what GitLab CI has, or GitLab um, as the basis is a, is a project, which is kind of your repository with uh, some other data around. And inside this repository, you configure the CI with a YAML file. Yay, YAML. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more YAML uh, uh, in this talk. Um, so, and uh, here you have your CI configuration. It's right in your Git repository. It's not an ID, uh, like an IDE in your uh, system where you have to configure it with forms. And I really like that because, yeah, it's versioned. You can copy it. It's a file. And I, I think this approach is also applied to other systems and or used in other systems. It's uh, of course, you can have quite some amount of YAML if, if projects get large, so there are some um, features to help you organize it better um, if, if you embrace them. And to be honest, GitLab CI config is pretty large. They pump out a lot of features, so they have a really tight schedule of, of delivering you uh, nice features, but this also means the, the complexity of the configuration expands over time because there are many, many different ways to do things and usually the documentation is pretty decent but it's it's a lot so um, yeah in, inside your project um, if you have a GitLab CI GitLab will basically if you push something and um, then it will start a pipeline and a pipeline is a, a, a single run of the CI with uh, jobs, which are actually things that do something, like you described, in different stages. And a job, um, for example, runs in a container. There are different ways to, to run jobs. Uh, this is called executors in GitLab CI. Um, ba basic idea is you have some kind of microservice, which is called GitLab Runner. You can run it locally on a shared server, on a Kubernetes cluster, and then you have an executor, which is like the strategy to use. Do I run my jobs in Docker containers or just as bash scripts? We, we use that, for example, to build apps on, an, on a Mac mini. Um, locally, they are, they are, you don't have Docker native, so we, we just use a bash executor, which works okay. So. Um, and many of these runners can be connected to one GitLab instance, which is pretty nice. So, um, but I will now focus mainly on containers because I think they have a lot of advantages of running CI jobs. You don't have a much better isolated environment with a perfect PHP version you need and libraries installed and whatever, and you can freely choose the perfect image as the base to run your thing, which is called a script. Um, a script is basically a l an array of commands, a list of commands that you want to perform, like um, run bin slash PHP unit with a configuration. That could be one script to run unit tests. So, and um, 
the, the job will mostly just run in the directory where you have a checkout of your project. So this, that is the, the basic configuration if you don't change anything, and then you can use the, the state of the project. And here you see again, it's, it's really valuable to have a monorepo because you have a single state of all your project components in one snapshot in a single commit, and um, th this helps here again. And a job also has rules. Rules are newer in uh, GitLab CI. Before, they uh, had different um, properties to adjust when a job should run and when not. And with rules, it's more complicated, but you can have like expressions based on variables. I want to run jobs if a merge request was created, if, it, if, if a commit was pushed to the, to the main branch, and um, also GitHub actions are pretty flexible in the way. But yeah, with rules, if you get used to it, you can do a lot of funny things and uh, can also break if you <laughs> don't really understand what they do. But um, there are some examples, and I, I also have the... Uh, whole example how to apply that them to a monorepository. So when the script runs, you create artifacts. For example, you install composer packages, and artifacts in, in GitLab CI basically say, I want to store these paths. In these paths of my project, I have a build output. That could be the output of a um, front-end build, compiling your assets, and then some CSS or JavaScript will be compiled and generated, or images or you install Composer, and that is your, we don't have traditionally a compile step in PHP applications, and so it doesn't really matter. You give GitLab CI a path, and then jobs can depend on other job artifacts, and you can say, give me the artifacts of this other job. I am interested in using them, and so through this, you can have a combination of, I do Composer install here, Yarn or NPM install and build there, and then have a later job which takes all that together and does something with it, like building a Docker image, um, like we later see. And an important thing to understand is caching of jobs, because you don't want to start with a completely fresh world every time. It's really beneficial to have, like, the already downloaded composer packages in some path and reuse them. So that's what we use. Um, there are different strategies, but I would recommend not to store the whole node modules folder, for example, or all installed packages in a cache, but rather the if you use a dependency manager, which obviously you want to use for NEOS, um, store the folder where the dependency manager downloads the packages in the cache. So which, which works pretty well, and it can safely be deleted, and uh, if you have if issues, but there are seldom issues with that. Maybe it gets larger if you have new versions and older don't get removed. So caches help you that you don't download the whole internet every time you start a new build. That, that really speeds things up. So if we combine all that, um, we end up with uh, stages, you can name the stages whatever you like. The basic idea is stages are like yeah, the pipeline in different stages. <laughs> so um, we start with the build, then do tests, then create our Docker images, which we then use to deploy to some environment. And after that, we use the freshly deployed instance to run acceptance tests. So this is our stage setup, for example. But for different projects, it might differ because we do things in another order and um, you're free to adjust. And by design or by standard, uh, GitLab would execute all the jobs in a stage in parallel, wait until all of them are finished, and then start with the next stage. And you can be more clever if you use needs. Needs is also a little bit newer. Um, it, it's there for quite some time, and it's, it's pretty usable right now, um, which uh, the jobs form a, a graph, a so-called so uh, DAG, um, Directed Acyclic Graph, um, which means it, it flows in one direction, basically. And what we can do, it reorders the jobs. So um, jobs in 
later stages can already begin if they don't have any needed dependency that is um, not yet finished. So, for example, the, the, the JavaScript tests could already run before you have a composer install or other things. So, also, this is making it nice. Um, if, if you work on your pipelines, then look where do I spend my time building things and then optimizing things with needs or caching. So first of all, like always in software development, make it work, then make it nice and efficient. So um, yeah, so that's really useful. And um, what we now do if we have all this set up in uh, GitLab CI is we want to create environments, deployments, basically. So GitLab calls that environment, which basically is anything you want to give a name, and it can have a URL if it's, it's a web uh, app or website. And what we use for in most projects, not only Neos, but also most other um, projects is a review environment. So the thing about review environments is it's auto-deployed for each merge request or branch. Um, and it is completely reset on each deployment. So it creates a fresh database state. It imports some site dump for Neos, for example, so that you have some starting ground. Or it, if you have a web application or other application, it imports some kind of uh, fixture data or create random fixture data. So we have all different approaches um, depending on the project, um, so where it makes sense. And uh, what you want to have in the end is to have a dynamic URL. So each merge request or brand gives you a, a shiny new URL where you can have a look at that deployed environment. So that that's what we want to you want to have. And um, we do not only want to have that for merge requests, I also want to do that for the default or main branch, master branch, whatever you call it. Um, and basically, the same rules apply. Um, you want to have a fresh instance. It should start with fresh data. And we also want a, a URL. But in this case, we kind of have only one default branch. So we can have a fixed URL. And this is quite handy, because um, you can bookmark it, and it, it always stays the, ch the, the same. And I, I really often use it to, ah, like, how is the latest state of this thing? And then you go to the integration URL, and you can see, ah, this is how it's currently done. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to, to use that uh, for feedback and having a look. Why does it break for this? Let's have a look at integration. Ah, it's done. Well, so it, it really helps to have this um, set up um, in place. And then we also have a staging environment. And staging is auto-deployed for tags. So whenever we tag a uh, commit, then the staging deployment is already executed. And the difference is, for staging, we decide to have persistent data. So we do not want to have a completely fresh setup, but for example, user-generated data or content changes uh, we want to keep them, and because staging should be should behave more like production, and um, nothing prevents you from having more than one staging, but that's our usual setup. So, um, staging also gets a fixed URL, and most of the time, staging is the part where you communicate or where we communicate with our customers. They are different, uh, in different uh, uh, depending on the situation we might want to collaborate on a feature, on a merge request. But most of the time, you can say, hey, here's the staging ver version. Have a look at it. Then we, we can do it in production. Um, and <laughs> even inside our team, we often have discussions. Why do we need an integration? Where's the difference to staging? <laughs> and yeah, I, in my view, integration is the most current state. It's always fresh. If you do content changes, for example, then yeah, you can test something out, but on the next deployment, it's overwritten and it's done. It's nothing you want to give a customer to test content, to start editing content. That's not good to have uh, to do on an integration system. And it, it should be like kind of your reference system. 
if somebody tells, oh, it works on my machine, now let's have a look at integration. And um, staging is more like a preview release. And so um, you can test also database and node migrations and other things, and you have more realistic content. Um, we often, well, if we have more complex things that we do, we, we start to get a production dump and import it into staging. Of course, make sure with uh, privacy concerns and delete user data and um, privacy-related data. And, um, but it, it's really cool to, to have that in staging make sure a new, newer, more complicated feature works. And um, yeah. So then after you've done that, of course, you want a production system. So production basically is also an environment. Um, depending on where, we, where you deploy it, um, it, it doesn't really matter for, for uh, GitLab. It's just a name for the environment. And uh, the strategy we use is, um, w this is newer. This also came out of a nice productive discussion, um, we, we decided to, we wanted to auto-deploy for version text because basically most of the time it's, it's tested before, we, we have quite some stuff, it shouldn't break dramatically. So we can just say, I tag a new version and I can go and after some time the pipeline is finished and it's deployed and I get a not notification via email or something. But sometimes you might have a more complicated feature that needs some collaboration to get into production. Maybe some other system where URLs need to be adjusted or whatever. There are a lot of cases. So we decided to have uh, some kind of suffix uh, which is allowed to semantic versioning and, and use something like release candidates and then starting to, to push them automatically to staging and then if everything is, is right then you can manually click and deploy to production. So I think this setup gives you the best of both ideas, having like small bug fixes that are automatically deployed and uh, yeah, more complex releases where you want to be in control to finally click on uh, deploy to production. Yeah. And so how we do it uh, for yeah, some years and we are shifting all the things we host and uh, to, to Kubernetes and also we have a lot of customers that are starting to use that as a technology. Well, first of all, we use it for CI jobs and our dev deployments in a development cluster, uh, but we also started to, to gain experience and using that for real in a production cluster for, for over a year and uh, this makes things really nice because you, because you can use the same artifacts locally for development uh, in your dev cluster for the environments and then just use the same things in production with slightly different settings and yeah that's that's really i think that's where the whole story really makes sense to to uh, use that hand in hand and um really short overview of of what you can do and and how that works I want to kubernetes is a, a pretty big thing but um I think the, the core things are not so hard to understand. Basically, you have the physical view of, of the system, which basically consists of a number of nodes or servers, um, which have different roles. Most of the time, you have some control plane, which doesn't do any relevant work. It's just for coordinating the cluster. And then you have a number of worker nodes, which could be quite high in a larger cluster. and. Um, our dev cluster uses four worker nodes, um, which is pretty much okay for our needs. And, and then you have a number of contain containers, and what Kubernetes does is, is it, it orchestrates the containers. So it makes sure the, the containers run on the correct node at the correct time and are stopped and started and configured correctly. And so that's, that's basically the job. And on the other hand, it's really a, a shift in paradigm on how we um, think about deployments because it's not, I don't think about having a, it on a server. It, it's more like we use the logical view of Kubernetes, which uh, deals with resources, for example, namespaces. We can use namespaces to separate customers and projects. And uh, then inside a namespace, we can have deployments, which are basically describing our applications. Um, 
And inside these deployments, we have uh, pods. Maybe you have heard the term before. It's strange in the beginning what is pod. I have containers, where the, where's the difference? But a pod is basically a collection of containers, and you can't get any smaller than a pod. So a pod is the smallest unit you can uh, Kubernetes deals with all containers in a pod are always running on the same server on the same node. So that, that gives you some nice guarantees. And yeah, with that, you can scale. You can say, oh, I want this pod two times. Of course, that's not easy. Sometimes you have a local file system. So getting things to scale is a completely other story, but it's possible. And um, this already gives you all the right tools and uh, yeah, like the domain language to think about that. And um, last things is a service connects uh, to your running containers, which have a web server or uh, the PHP or what, whatever you are deploying. And uh, for our case, uh, most important, we have dynamic URLs, which is called an ingress. We can assign a dynamic URL. You can automatically create uh, SSL certificates with Let's Encrypt and everything. So it's, it's, in, it's, it's a lot of complexity, but, but it gives you a nice dynamic system. It's, it's really working out perfectly for, for these use cases. So, And this is our dev setup. We have a GitLab CI namespace. And for each project, we have dev namespaces. And in GitLab CI, for example, we have our GitLab runner. And like I said, we use a Kubernetes executor. And this makes sure all our uh, development jobs are scheduled as pods to Kubernetes. And nice thing is um, Kubernetes scheduler will figure out, OK, which server has enough, or well, has the least amount of CPU or memory and has all the required metadata set to run this. And, and it will schedule it. So it, you can have a large number of, of jobs running in parallel. So without dealing on a single server, it's quite hard to scale if, if, if you have one project where many developers will push at the same time and lots of pipelines run at the same time. So uh, that's, that's finally solved with having that. So yeah, multiple pods can start. Inside the pods, GitLab will start containers. But you don't have to deal with that. It's, it's just. Like I said, a, a job with a script, and GitLab, exe uh, the Kubernetes executor, will do the right thing for Kubernetes. And then, uh, after our deployment is done, we have a deployment, for example, for integration with an ingress with our URL we want uh, or decided to use. And uh, di directly besides that, we can have a review deployment with a dynamic name. We, we mostly use the branch name or CI commit ref uh, variable, and that gets another ingress. So you can dynamically create a lot of instances. You have, don't do that, but you can have, have a lot of branches open at the same time. And, uh, but yeah, don't do that. Only have a few branches at a time. <laughs> um, yeah, so one little detail um, is how is that connected? GitLab uh, has a setting to connect clusters. They are changing that um, currently to a new agent-based approach. But basically, you can like create your namespace in, in a Kubernetes cluster. You don't have to do that yourself. You can use a managed cluster or do that somewhere. And you, I think GitLab has some tooling for, for AWS or GK, yeah, GKE or I don't know, the EKS. I'm, I'm not using that for Kubernetes. Um, so, um, and, and you connect, connect it. And the nice thing is um, GitLab CI will have a complete Kubernetes client configured for you. If you use the Kubernetes tooling and you have a connected cluster, it will automatically have all the uh, setup with the certificates and everything to talk to your cluster. So, and up there, you can it's a little small, but uh, nice thing is you can have like a dev cluster and a production cluster, and say, ah, for production environment, I want to use the production cluster. So it's multi-cluster. Um, it's, it's really easy to use. Just name your environments, and you can choose which cluster should be used. So that's it's really working well. So um, what do we use to run stuff in Kubernetes? Uh, 
of course, YAML, um, and uh, these are called manifests. And um, the whole idea is your resources you run are de de declarative. Um, you describe the state you want to have in the system, and um, all the things like deployments, ingress, service are called resources. Kubernetes is in itself an ecosystem of extensible, a little bit like a content repository with different node types, just with lots of microservices and, um, yeah. And um, metadata, of course, labels, annotations, you can do fancy stuff with that, like tag your stuff and say, oh, I want to automate backups for that, and I want to do this, so you can get crazy with that. Um, yeah, how do you manage that? So lots of YAML, how do we do that? In the beginning, we used uh, bash scripts and just replaced some variables, but that certainly didn't scale for larger stuff and was always n a not so nice solution. And um, I finally started to use Helm after <laughs> being a little bit reluctant to do that. And uh, Helm is, in its current version, basically just a template engine. Um, give it values, you have templates, it creates YAML, and Helm manages applying that to Kubernetes as resources. And it, that, that works reasonably well. So um, yeah, the, the unit you work with in Helm are so-called charts. What we use, for example, uh, is uh, bundling that in the monorepo, so we have just a Helm folder with the templates, so it's easy to adapt per project. And for the, so the de deployment, the ingress, if you need special annotations to, for example, enable basic authentication or stuff like that, it's um, on the resources and you can adjust that and use uh, values depending on environment on, uh, yeah, customization through values. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. So you think about the API of your chart in terms of these values, then implement that in templates. And in the end, Helm will manage releases, and uh, release will have metadata, which values were used, a version number, and it, it can be managed via Helm, so it's easy to test that locally and just create a new release, and, um, but it's also easy to do in the CI. So it's basically easy. I, I, I always need to use custom Docker images. I don't know why, but I always have ideas that are not done anywhere else, and I need to create custom Docker images for that. But yeah, um, and what I found out, what's really nice to do and helps us a lot, with, because it's, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's the little things. Um, it's not, if you have an, some understanding of that, it's not so hard to do it, but I always need some hours to get a reasonably large project done if I start to, to do new stuff. Um, it's because everything must be consistently named and variables here and environments, variables there, and everything has fit together. And unit tests in Helm really helped me um, getting it right before doing lots of cycles on the actual CI, which always takes some minutes. And uh, so you can have snapshots. If I have these templates and these values, I want to create this YAML, and it will snapshot that, and so you can refactor. It's, it's really nice. And you can also have custom assertions, um, test different values, and see that some parts of your YAML change. So um, it, it's not hard to do. It's, it's really easy, and it, it helps you developing Helm charts. And so it's, I always thought about, oh, no, I don't want to do all my own Helm charts. And yeah, that's, it's, it's quite doable with that. Yeah, some example how that looks in practice is this, uh, it's a little bit small to read for you, but basically we have a lot of YAML and we have uh, like our project components or things we need to deploy like a Postgres server and the NEOS itself and maybe other parts. Um, and uh, these are, you can decide how you structure that. That is your thing, how you want to deal with the configuration. and. Uh, then you can have uh, settings on your NEOS, environment variables, and extend that. Um, so, and, but the most important thing is we uh, use Git uh, Docker images with tags. And of course, if, you, if we want to deploy branches, we need separate Docker images 
with the code for this branch. So we use uh, tags and use um, like an uh, CI commit ref or some other slug for the, it's not allowed to use every, every character for a Docker image tag, so must to be careful there, but um, basically we use different tags and so the, the Helm chart uses the correct uh, tag for the Docker image for that environment. So how that looks is like this is our deployment job, for example, and we, this is a rule, it runs for the default branch, it's, it's the integration job, and here we configure our environment, and this is basically all the, the whole special configuration for integration. I decided to just have it here in line and not sitting somewhere else, but it's, it's up, up to you how you want to write that, and um, so this is basically overriding the default values, because for integration, I want to set up an admin user with a not-so-secret password, maybe automatically import a site package. I decide on the actual URL with uh, the, the TLS certificate and give it some annotations so GitLab can find it, and here I use the tag that uh, is dynamically built for this yeah, basically it's always latest here, but um, for review deployments it matters. So, um, and I want to use and then a Postgres server. So we, we run for production, we run Postgres in a cluster, our setup. But here um, it's just a deployment, and we throw it away if we're done. So it's it's a little bit easier. Yeah, this this is basically the workflow, and I found it really nice in comparison to what we've done before. Yeah, so. If you want to build Docker images, there are quite some tools. I always look, what, what can we do better? Can, is there something easier? And we settled with Kaniko. I don't know if any of you heard about that. <laughs> and, uh, but, but it's really nice if you want to build Docker images in unprivileged environments. So unprivileged means you don't need access to the Docker's daemon with the Docker socket. Uh, so this is also called Docker in Docker, and I, I never liked it, uh, and I wouldn't recommend it. And these were always the official examples of GitLab. Just use Docker in Docker, share your Docker socket, and yeah, it's basically like giving root access to your server. So it's, it's not a good idea. And Carnico runs in a container and um, doesn't need privileged uh, builds and um, is mostly completely compatible with Docker builds. So, but we found some edge cases, and I, I think I also fixed a bug there once. Um, and nice thing is you can have a shared build cache, which can speed up your Docker build, builds. If you know about Docker and the layer build cache, um, that, that's nice for CI, so you don't do all the builds, build steps for each build job, um, because some things don't change so much. And yeah, we, we use a custom Carnico image. I will try to, I don't have these repositories uh, public already, uh, already, but I, I will try to get them public so you can have a look at, that, at, at them too. So it's nothing special, it's mostly bundled build scripts and some plumbing to making it work, but these are mostly the things you have to figure out and that, that's takes, that, that takes time and is tedious. And for Prod, we use Harbor, which is another container registry, which we deploy in a, with higher availability for these Docker images for integration and review environments. We use the, the built-in um, GitLab registry, which is easy to use because it's pre-configured. You already have access to it in a CI job. And yeah, so. A bonus thing is you can have reproducible builds, and that's a really nice feature for Carnico, um, that the same files <coughs> will always produce the same digest or hash of your Docker image. So uh, th this is also gives you some nice things you can do with that. So in the end, we have an, uh, an environment in GitLab where, for example, our integration uh, environment is deployed. We see this, this is the annotations for um, for GitLab on the deployment gives you this view. You see, ah, there are two pods. It's completely deployed. It's it's a little bit of 
uh, sugar on top. Um, but, but mainly it's interesting, you have a button and can go directly to the environment. So basically in all our projects we have a list of environments, you can choose where to go, you see what's deployed, and that's really nice to have an overview. So one last topic I wanted to, to show you, because I think it's, it really, it's, it's two more, but um, th this is a little bit larger, and uh, it, it's Playwright. It, it really changed the way for us recently how we can do end-to-end -end tests. So we, also started to use Cypress after dealing with um, Behead, Selenium, WebDriver for uh, too many time and it, it always had issues and we tried to work al around them but I never was completely happy to do it for a lot of projects. And um, So in Playwright you code tests in, in TypeScript or JavaScript but it really works out, works out nicely with TypeScript if you have TypeScript uh, some TypeScript experience, and well, what's nice is yeah, it feels just like regular JavaScript, and Cypress was a little bit too jQuery-like for me. It's, it's a lot of magic under the hood. It, you don't see why things are asynchronous or not, and if something waits and has side effects. It's, I, I didn't experience that with Playwright, and um, what's really, really nice is the idea to have a page object model. So basic idea is you have a page, may, may, maybe with a form. Forms are really a thing you want to test most of the time. And um, you need some way to fill form fields, to, to get the form field by label and not by some fixed selector. Don't do that. It's, it, it's bound to break. I always would use something that's near to the customer that also might change, but then change your test, and it, it, if you change the, the label from email to email address, yeah, then your test should also change. But not due to some um, development detail, like, oh, it's not the eighth child, it's now the ninth child, and it doesn't work. So these are unstable selectors. It's a bad idea, in my experience. So you can capture this knowledge in uh, a class, and provide a nice API and then just use these to access your stuff and also use that for special stuff that's more involved, like having a registration form class using parts of that and having some additional stuff or if you have fancy inputs. And so that really helps to structure your code and if you apply that, you can have yeah, especially for forms, I said that. Um, you, you can have nice tests that are really um, dealing, ah, that you can read. Await until the contact form field name is filled with Christopher. So it's, it's just one line, it's, it's pretty readable, and uh, that, that's not too hard to achieve. So that's why you don't need something like Cucumber, in my experience, for, for these kinds of... It also has some good ideas, and but it also helps having not this translation stage. So less indirection, more direct code. It's, it's simpler, and yeah, so I like that. And our idea was, yeah, let's use the integration and review um, uh, environments for acceptance tests because we already deploy them. And uh, you can write a Playwright config. And so basically, this is doing the magic. Locally, I use my locally running flow server. For the environments, I use a base URL environment variable, and now I can have dynamic URLs based on the environment. And all the other stuff, it, I, it, it's too much detail right now, but these are nice things you can use in CI to have retries and capture traces for debugging. Um, and what we did for one project so far is uh, use that extensively to not directly go on the content pages because there you would test the content if, and if content is changed, tests might break. But we directly go to Monocle and uh, use the style guide preview of components and run acceptance tests there. That runs reasonably well. So you can test your presentation and components, especially if they use some JavaScript on top. And um, you can also test complete 
uh, nearest URLs, of course, that's, that's even easier. And what we do right now is basically have a site dump with some fixed content, automatically importing that on the deployed environments. What you can do and what we did do um, is uh, have a REST API only enabled for these environments to, to deal with fixture data. Create a user account here, delete some stuff. Um, depends on your project what, what you need. And what I really like about Playwright, it makes your tests reliable. They can be retried. They have good auto weight and handling if elements are not visible directly, but loaded dynamically or via JavaScript or after a request is finished. So these work quite out of the box, really. So it's, it's nothing we had to deal. So a lot of years ago when we tried that the first time with Selenium and WebDriver, these were quite the deal because it, uh, you had to do all this yourself. And um, it wasn't ready for dynamic pages, really. So. Um, Another thing is traces for debugging. It's, it's all, they have a pretty good documentation. Idea is if something fails, it can be retried, but then Playwright is configured to start a trace, which basically captures screenshots and what it does. And <clears throat> it can be viewed locally with a trace viewer. So if things go out of hand, you can view the traces and they give you a visual idea. Oh, I got an error message. I didn't expect to have that in that scenario. And you can most of the time reproduce it quite well locally and many more. So just have a look at the project and the documentation and um, uh, I, XHR requests. And one important thing is you can run that really easy. They have uh, pre-made Docker images with uh, I think Chromium, uh, Firefox, and Edge. So you can multi-browser tests too, in a, like a matrix tests. Uh, there are so many good things, and it is, you don't have to do your doc own Docker images there. They are just ready to use, and uh, it's, it's, it's solid engineering, really. And um, yeah, the last thing, which is really nice, is to use Lighthouse CI for the measurement. And um, I will call it L LHCI, which is easier written than spoken. And LHCI is a standalone server. I think many of you know Lighthouse. It's built in in Chrome. Uh, you can measure your site, get like web vitals and, and scores for performance and accessibility, and you get issues and can improve your site, which is basically important for customers because it's part of the SEO ranking and also how well it is perceived for users of the site because performance obviously matters. And uh, LHCI is like a standalone server which does not do the tests but captures the test reports. So you can have Lighthouse Runner which does the actual tests and reports it to a Lighthouse CI server. And the uh, nice thing is it maintains a history so you can see how did we, how did the uh, metrics evolve over time? Or even if we do this change, how would the metrics change? This is what I, I find really interesting because you test, can test single merge requests and see how it would affect uh, loading times or other metrics. And um, yeah, LHCI, you can, can deploy that. We, we just deployed that in the dev cluster have some small webhook to automatically set, up, set it up for GitLab, and then we can measure. So we run that for deployed environments and um, use some include to make it easy to, to, to use in, in new projects. And um, one thing we found out, which I think is a important information, don't do that on shared instances. It gives you really shaky, jittery results. So we use a single instance with a yeah, kind of bare metal, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a cloud server, and uh, run it there because it, it, doesn't, it, it must not have a shared CPU. And uh, because otherwise, each test run would give you different performance results be because it depends on the actual performance, not the accessibility scores. These are more um, done by rules. So yeah, I, I, I would use that. Uh, 
you, you should, uh, if, if you want to do that, that really makes the difference to make it usable. And now we can compare huh, and uh, see our, this is our report. And for example, here you see I, I tried to improve something on the Neos demo side. The logo had a missing alternative text. And now I see, ah, for this branch, I got a, an accessibility improvement. So you can really measure and see, yeah, it really improves. It's not something, yeah, we tried that. It, hmm, let's, let's have a look at that again. And um, yeah, I, I, I really like that. So it, it helps you having a faster feedback cycle for also for that. So, and now what it looks like, just in short, uh, if, if everything is put together, um, I, I have the complete example in this repository. Like I said, some of the Docker images are not public, or so I, we work on that to, to make them public so you can completely use our setup or improve it in your own environments if you like. And um, so I, I create some change, push it to, to GitLab, create a new merge request. So I just did that this morning and uh, I, I changed, uh, I added a new image and exported the site uh, again, changed some uh, CSS, pushed it, and now the pipeline was running. And if you click there, you can go to the pipeline. You see this, these are all the jobs. And then, yeah, the psalm is not, not happy with the code in, in the demo site. Uh, but you can work on that. So um, the deployment uh, job is running. And uh, if you click into the job, you can get uh, some, some log. I, most of you that deal with CI know that you can see the script output. And if it's done, we have a new environment for the review system. And if I go there, we see our new Neos demo site. So it really worked like in 10 minutes during the breakfast. <laughs> you have to trust me. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I, I see we are a little bit, should get to the end. I prepared some nice jumel, YAML memes. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry we can go through all the, of them, but yeah. Yeah, in, in the end, I, I mean, YAML is a tool. You know it with uh, no types, but uh, <laughs> yeah, like don't, don't do like, Norway or an O, no, it's a Boolean. Ah, you, have to, you have to know the rules, then you can work with it. And they, there are some non-intuitive rules in, in YAML, but uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it's okay. No, it, it's the tool of choice for DevOps and for NEOS. So um, yeah, what we learned, just really short, this is the DevOps cycle, you know it. Um, it doesn't really capture what we do because like we verify after releasing again and yeah, we. But what I wanted to show is we cover a lot of ground. We go into the creation, verification, packaging, release, configuration, and monitor. It's, it's not all of it, but it it's qu covers quite a lot of ground. So monitoring in production is quite another story or can be built on top of that. And what I wanted to, to give you is uh, re re reliability is key here. So nobody uses it is, uh, or is always unhappy if your pipelines are breaking and shaky. So do less, make it reliable, then improve. And pipelines must not be slow. If you have to wait like more than 10 minutes for something, it's, it's too slow. And, uh, and they shouldn't block you from doing what you actually want. If you know what you're doing, then you should be allowed to do it. It, it should not be like full control. Um, it, it should be a tool that helps you. And uh, yeah, share common con CI configuration. Don't reinvent the wheel every time. Um, but yeah, you can evolve. And uh, don't get too fancy. Make, make it simple. Keep it explicit. And yeah, cache what you can to make it fast. And uh, yeah, building Docker images is hard if you. Uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Yeah. So Whoa. we will have no time for questions. Uh, really. I actually wanted to ask you a question, but <laughs> yeah. you uh, just answered it yourself. So yes. Uh, yeah. One of the questions uh, from the app, which was whether your Kubernetes deployment is open source or not? Uh, the deployment itself not, but this whole CI setup for a project is, uh, this is the demo project, and yeah. I will share the slides with the link, and yeah, this Perfect. is, so the whole CI thing, the Kubernetes stuff itself is Ansible based, and so th that's not, that's not s too interesting, because you can use any Kubernetes cluster basically to do that, so. Okay. Yeah. So Perfect. Yeah. Cool. You are available for questions afterwards. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And online, of course, yeah. for sure. And you're present. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This is for you, Christopher. Yeah. All right.